This is a spoiler warning, you insignificant worms. So take heed, for I am Baal Zaman, heart of the dark. The lowly mortal who creates this content has read the series cover to cover, book to book, many, many times. He will be discussing everything he can think of, irrelevant, relevant, regardless. So... Take heed of my warning. If you have not read the series all the way through and spoil something for yourself, well, who is to blame, listener? Not I. Not I. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the very first Return to the Wheel of Time podcast, and welcome to Gleeman Radio. I think it's going to be our first video, too. Uh, I am super excited. I love, love the Wheel of Time, and I can't, I can't help it. I need to return to it. I mean, return to it isn't the right word, even though that's the title of the series. It's, I recently uh, started listening to several podcasts on the Wheel of Time and some rereads on the Wheel of Time, and I'm currently still following several of those, and I'm having so much fun with them, and the thing is, is every time I listen to them, I kind of go, oh man, I really want to make one of those for myself. I really want to dive into the Wheel of Time myself and discuss it with people. But unfortunately, and I bet there's a lot of people out here listening that can actually relate to this. I don't have a whole lot of people in my life who like or even know what the Wheel of Time is. Uh... I've had a lot of friends, I've had several families who have kind of been introduced a little bit to the series with me, but there's so much of it and they just, you know, not everybody wants to put in that time, which uh, I can definitely understand, but it is my favorite fantasy series of all time. Nothing outranks the Wheel of Time for me personally, and I just really want to talk about it. And if I don't have anyone physically near me to talk about it, well, You know what? I'm going to talk about it online, and hopefully I can start a discussion with you guys in the comments, or we can even find a way for um, viewer participation or listener participation if people get more interested. I'm super excited. The the show is, like, in production or something, and I want to be really optimistic about that because that one pilot I saw a while back was boring. Boring is the word I want to use, and that's that's not what I want to apply to the Wheel of Time, even though I've heard so many people call it dry at times, or way too rambly at times, or I don't know, I don't mind the ramble. You're probably going to hear me ramble off on this all the time. I just hit the record button on my computer and started talking, and I don't even remember everything I was talking about, so we'll see how well this goes. But, uh, so for now, I'm hoping this will be... Your daily dose of Wheel of Time. Yeah, I said daily. I'm hoping at that for now. What I'm going to do is over this weekend, uh, I'm going to start recording. I'm going to record several chapters over this weekend. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to start posting them one chapter a day on here. So I have plenty of time to talk about any chapter. You know, if there's so much great stuff happening in that chapter, I can laugh and talk about it. I can needle through all the details. I can point out all this and that. I can just nerd out on it. And if the chapter's bad, well, I can complain about it for as long as I want. So everything will be fine. The problem is, is this is going to take forever. I think we already know that. This is going to take absolutely forever. No joke about it. Uh, especially one a day thing. I mean, chap book one, the eye of the world is what fifty three chapters. So that means fifty three days. Uh, does, does, am I going to be posting on the weekends? I don't know yet. I just I want to do Wheel of Time content, and I'm super excited about doing it. All right, so my main introductions out of the way, and I do want to move on directly to the prologue, so we can start talking about that. But there is one more thing I want to talk about, and that's my uh, Balsamon intro. I hope you guys liked that. I hope it wasn't too loud. Let me know anything, any criticism there. Um, It was just really fun to do. Uh, The picture uh, is absolutely amazing, and it said it was 
by Revenant Rising. And I do hope that is correct. I just want to shout out for Revenant Rising. That is amazing. And if uh, it's not done by Revenant Rising and someone is claiming that work, uh, please, please do something about it. I, I, I don't know. I, I just hope it was by the correct person and I wanted to have a little shout out saying it was amazing looking. And uh, I hope they're okay with me using it in that intro. Uh, if not, they can let me know uh, and I'll just find something else. So without further ado, I'm going to go listen to the prologue right now. I'm going to take some notes about it and I'm, I'm going to come back and we're going to talk about it. I have no idea how long this podcast could be. It could be very short. It could be very long. I have no clue, but I am so damn excited. Uh, I don't know if I have to give a, uh, I never thought about it in my Balsamon opening. I do not know if I have to give a language warning. Uh, sometimes I swear, sometimes I don't, sometimes I don't even notice. So for now, <laughs> maybe I'll have to adjust it. Uh, we're, we're, I'm going to stop rambling. I'm going to go listen to the podcast right now, and we're going to move on, and this is going to be great. Remember, you fool. Remember your futile attack on the great Lord of the Dark? Remember his counterstroke? Remember, even now the hundred companions are tearing the world apart, and every day a hundred men more join them. What hand slew Ilyena's son here, Kinslayer? Not mine. Not mine. What hand struck down every life that bore a drop of your blood? Everyone who loved you. Everyone you loved. Not mine, Kinslayer. Not mine. Remember, I know the price of opposing Shaitan. I mean, well, that was that was that was tragic. Uh, no matter how many times I've read that prologue, it's still so sad. I, I it, oh, the poor Luz Theron. I mean, you got this guy who was the hero of the age. He was the big Kahuna. He was the big deal, and now he's wandering through his mansion just lost in madness, calling for Ileana as he steps over her dead body, his eyes not catching every other dead body he steps over. They talked about how, like, the earth came up and smothered some of his family and friends and servants. It was, oh, it's just so, it, it's still so sad. I mean, poor Luz Theron, this, and, uh, you also, when you think about it, like, I don't know when the time frames hook up exactly, but this, this really cannot be that long after, uh, Luce Theron sealed the boar. It can't be, because it's my understanding that he went in with a hundred companions, which weren't quite a hundred, I think it was like, uh, 97 or something, I don't know, I, I don't remember where I got that information. Um, I think it was in the glossary or, you know, the, uh, the companion or the white Bible, whatever that's called. I don't remember the wheel of time. I can't read it well enough because it's in my bookshelf in the dark room across the way. But, uh, I remember I read that somewhere. It wasn't even a hundred companions. They were just called that, which I always liked. Uh, the, everybody went mad instantly with the Dark One's Counterstroke. Instantly. And since Luce Theron was leading the, uh, the channeling, I mean, he went mad first. And I think he just went straight home. So this is either, like, hours, this, or, like, a single day after the boar. And, you know, he's just walking around, not noticing all the dead bodies. It's super sad. And then Elon Morin Tedronai shows up. Oh, man. Oh, God. Elon Morin is the example, the definition of too many aliases. Elon Morin Tedronai, his first name, I think it was his given name when he was born, when he was the scholar and philosopher. And then, you know... Betrayer of Hope, and then, uh, which is, I think, Ishamael, and then, you know, Baal Zaman, and then Moradin, and then whatever the hell he called himself when he was with uh, Arter Hawkwing. Oh my goodness, he has so many names. Which is the, the, the clear point of why this prologue is so much better on the reread than the original. Do you remember the first time 
you read this prologue, you're sitting here trying to figure out what the hell is going on. Who is Luce Theron, huh? Luce Theron, tell a what? Uh, Elon Moore and who? This is ridiculous, these names. And they're talking about, you know, we got that really fun Easter egg. If he shows up, obviously using the true power, obviously using the Dark One's power, because, you know, the way he's illustrated traveling there. I mean, it could be that Robert Jordan hadn't, switch things up yet, but I think there's enough there to prove he was using the other one. Uh, and what's even crazier is if you really stop to think about it, you don't think about it in your first read. You might even not even thinking about it entirely in your second read, but why the hell is a Shamael there right after the boar was sealed? And the only thing I can think of is perhaps the true power protected him, or the dark one protected him, or he noticed what was happening and went inside, what, what is a dream shard, or he escaped into Telaran Riyadh, or I, I, maybe he got, a, got like sealed midway, so maybe, I, I, I don't know, it's my understanding that he was a legitimate male dreamer, so I, who knows how he did it, but it's, it's really remarkable to think about. If you have any... Uh, ideas, put it down in the comments below. How do you think Ishamayel is here right now? Because he absolutely shouldn't be. It's against the rules, man. The Dark One wins again. Oh my goodness. Uh -huh. Anyways, so Ishamayel shows up. I don't want to keep saying Aloran uh, Moran Tedronai. I, I don't want to. Uh, Betrayer of Hope shows up. And uh, you can tell he's actually shocked. He's like, wow, you're this mad already? Holy shit. What a, wow, I didn't expect this. And uh, in, in another weird moment when he's lifting his cloak not to touch any of the dead as he's deftly stepping around him. Who, why Why would Ishamayel care if his cloak kind of trailed in a little blood or something? He, I, I, may, I, I don't know. I, I, I imagine he's killed so many people. I mean, but maybe he, you know, he does it in a posh, classy way where he just kills them across the room. Uh, <laughs> you know, I don't want to get a, you know, any of the dead body on me. Ew. Uh, I'm one of the most evil men in the world. I, I, I don't, I don't, I don't know. Uh, it's amusing to me. But, you know, he's going over and he's shocked that uh, Luz Theron is as crazy as he is. And he's actually kind of pissed about it. And he starts ranting at Luz Theron. And uh, to be honest, I think the whole reason he healed Luz Theron wasn't just to give him a brief moment of clarity. I mean, you got to admit, Luz Theron, uh, Balzaman, Ishamai Hell, Elon Moran, Tetranite, goodness, which name am I going to use here? Uh, he wanted... Loose Theron to know the depths of his defeat, but I think it was more he's pissed that he's given this big grandiose monologue and Loose Theron isn't paying attention, so he heals him. Uh, and uh, that monologue has some interesting bits when you think about it. And uh, what's cool is you can actually, with the Will of Time companion, you can actually know what some of that is. He said, you were once first among the servants, like wearing the Ring of Tamerlan. And you can actually look that up here. And the Ring of Tamerlan is a legendary ring believed mythical by most people, worn by... Worn, I'm sorry, I was skipping a line. Worn by the leader of the Aes Sedai during the Age of Legends, stories about the Ring of Tamerlan said that it was an Angrial, Sa-Angrial, or Ter-Angrial of immense power. It supposedly was named after the first person to learn how to tap into the true source and channel the one power. And in some tales, was actually made by that man or woman. Despite what many Aes Sedai said, no one knew whether it was a man or woman who first learned to channel. Some believe that the title of Amerlin was a corruption of Tomerlin. I'm sorry I read that poorly, but um, you gotta admit that's fascinating. And then the other one I actually marked in here was, um, it was something I always wanted to know before I got this book. And that was when uh, Balzaman, Elon Mortedronai, says that you summoned the Nine Rods of Dominion. And I actually looked with that up. And I always thought they were Terangrial. You know, because you keep seeing the white fluted rod is Terangrial. Elaine does something with a red rod that's really embarrassing. There's a Balefire rod. So you're like, oh, these might be the rods of, Tam you know, the nine rods of Tamerlan. Or maybe the oath rods were them. Um, but actually, the nine rods of Tamerlan 
were, I mean, sorry, the Nine Rods of Dominion. Goodness, not the Nine Rods of Tamerlan. The Nine Rods of Dominion were nine individuals of the Age of Legend who served as regional governors of the world at the time. Ishamayel said that Luz Theron had summoned them, which was an indication of Luz Theron having had ultimate authority. And that me, you know, I, I think that's, you know, ultimate political authority because back then, Aes Sedai were supposed to be the legitimate servants of all, not like how they became in the modern version of the series. They gained status, as my understanding went with it, by doing works for the people. Like, you know, how many times have you read the series and wondered why are all the Aes Sedai holed up in the tower? Why aren't the yellows out more than anyone else? The blues are the ones that are out the most? No. Why aren't the yellows out healing people left and right? But uh, the White Tower has kind of become a little bit more greedy and corrupted over the years. And it's kind of really freaking sad. Um, I, I, I'm getting off topic here. So yeah, uh, Luz, Th Luz Theron is healed by his ultimate foe because he really wants to get that monologue in, monologue in and he wants Luz Theron to pay attention. Um, and that's where we get some cool stuff. Uh, uh, first sad stuff, because he is... Apparently, the true power's healing is just incredibly painful. And that's never fun. I mean, yikes. Uh, <laughs> he, he talked about how he... You know, you gotta, you gotta think that Luce Theron is a pretty strong dude. Pretty, you know, with all the war and everything, that he'd be pretty good against pain. But... This put him on the ground for what he felt was a thousand years. I mean, this is rough stuff. And then, like, the first thing he sees is Ileana's corpse. And they describe, like, the scream what that came out of his mouth was inhuman. Oh, it's just even sadder. But then we get the good moments. Then we get uh, Luz Theron. Uh, Luz Theron raised his head and the black-clad man took an involuntary step back back from that gaze. Ten years, betrayer, Luce Theron said softly, the sound of steel being bared. Yeah, Luce Theron's kicking some ass here. Uh, you know, that's that's when the old, uh, the, the, the non-madness, he's coming out. He's even made Ishamayel take a step back, which I loved. But the ten years comment always kind of confused me, to be completely honest. I thought the war went on for way longer than that. And I don't I don't know. Maybe maybe the full war only went on for ten years. Maybe it was kinda like with the Wheel of Time, how every you know, we're leading up to Tarmageddon, right? Maybe uh I'm thinking that, that everybody has been fighting the whole time and then like their major war took ten years. So like Tarmageddon took ten years. Like, you know, like something like that. Like Tarmageddon take 10 years you get what i meant like the the full-on war took 10 years but maybe they've been fighting for a while before that i don't know it seems too short for like how everything is described only 10 years really um but yeah so he goes on about 10 years and then ashamayel goes on about his oh no not 10 years we've been fighting since the beginning of time and we'll fight again and again and again you know balzaman's whole thing about thinking he's the dark one's champion which i honestly think is true um, but yeah, so, you know, they go on, you know, we fought for this, we fought for that, you know, and then he's like, I'll kill you because Eliana, and he's like, yeah, I didn't kill Eliana, but you heard that quote at the beginning of, uh, before I start talking about the prologue, because, uh, I'm going to be putting in a quote from every chapter if I can manage it. I don't think, um, copyright problems are going to happen from a couple second clip. Um, but, you know, who knows? So, <laughs> Luz Theron's ready to fight, uh, but then, you know, Ashamiel gets his rile in and makes Luz Theron step back, which I also like. It, I mean, it's... I really think of these two as equals. They were the most powerful uh, channelers on the Earth at that point. Uh, Westland, Randland, whatever. They were the most powerful people in that world, staring each other down. And... Uh, and then Luce Theron just kind of chickens out and kills himself. I, not chickens out. You, I, I, 
Looking back, it would have been really cool to see them go at least a few blows, wouldn't it? Just a few fireballs. Uh, maybe Lucerne would have been crazy enough to use bale fire. I don't know. It would have been really cool to see them throw a few swings rather than f throw a few insults. Uh, but Lucerne just so horrified at what he did, so horrified at what he's been through. So he, he transports himself away. Uh, and says he can't feel a living being for like a hundred leagues. And I still don't know how he knows this. Um, does he have perhaps a Terangrial on his body that allows him to know that? I, I don't know. Maybe there's a weave. Maybe there's a warding. I, I, I don't know how he would know that there's no one around. Uh, and then he does the whole bringing down the lightning strike to destroy himself. Now, I've heard people call this bale fire. But I've never, ever believed this is Balefire. And that's because they describe when the bar of light, which is, I think, why people call it Balefire. They say something like the bar of light was only there for an instant, touch between the sky and the ground. But then they describe the ground kind of just smashing and imploding and rocks just crumbling. And, you know, if it was Balefire, it just would have struck and things would have vanished. It wouldn't have been that violent. Uh, so yeah, lightning came down, Luz Theron is dead, and then we get those prophecies, and then you have, uh, no, no, then you have Isha, uh, Shamael waving his fist at him, you know, saying, this isn't over, dragon, we're gonna fight again, uh, and it's, personally, my theory here is I don't think Shamael came here just to gloat, I think he was doing what he does while he was in Luce Theron's present. He was playing his role. But personally, I think part of the reason he healed him, all jokes aside, jokes about wanting to hear his monologue and wanting Luce Theron to suffer, I believe those are true. But I also believe knowing what we know of the Dark One's champion going forward, what we know about Ashamael's philosophies, his ideals, his thought processes. He's always wanted it to be over. You know, I think he was truly hoping in his madness that Luce Theron would strike him down. And I don't think Balzaman would have put up too much of a fight, to be honest. I think he wanted to die because I think he knew what his situation was. And he did not want to be trapped in between for 3,000 years. He knew his people, his fellow forsaken, his tools for use, you know, to him, were locked away. He knew his master was locked away. And now he knew he had to wait because he believed this fight had been going on forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. Now he has to wait, and that's the one thing he doesn't want. You know, why does... The Dark One bring him back after book three. That is because to Ishamael, to Moradin, there is no greater torture than being there when he thinks the outcome is inevitable. So I honestly think he wanted to die. And he was really, really mad that Luce Theron took out himself instead of perhaps both of them. I mean, honestly, what would you want in his position? Would you rather stay alive until the next age happen to deal with all this bull crap? Or would you want to just die and fight Rand in the next age? I think the choice is obvious. I don't know. Let me know your opinion in the comment section below. So, I, I don't know. I think that's enough talking about the prologue. Uh, I, I went on way longer than I thought I would. Uh, I hope I don't ramble too much going forward. Uh, but, yeah, that's I, that's it for the prologue. I was, yeah, this is fun. I hope you guys enjoy this. Well, guys, that's really everything for the very first episode of The Return of the Wheel of Time. I hope you're enjoying Gleeman Radio. I hope you enjoyed this video. Uh, right now, I'm going to be posting these on YouTube. But what I really hope to do is once I get through Eye of the World and if I'm getting some decent feedback, uh, even if it's just like a dozen people enjoying them, 
uh, then I think I will uh, take the plunge and actually cut a bunch of these chapters together and put them out on a podcast hosting sites as a full podcast, like, you know, uh, several chapters at a time, like a uh, chapter prologue through chapter three or four covers, you know, the prologue and Rand going through everything and leaving with his father before all the winter night thing starts. That's a good set. I could put that into a podcast, but we'll see. Uh, I do have a couple requests for you out there if you are enjoying this content. Uh, I really don't think there's enough Wheel of Time fan art in the world, and I can't draw worth crap. So if you guys are actually willing to draw some of your favorite moments in this series and send them to me, uh, if you're able to get to them in time, I, I really hope to be able to put them in the actual video podcasts I'm doing of the subjects. Uh, you get a shout out because of how awesome you are. Uh, I just think it'd be really cool. Also, if you guys don't like my intro and want to re-record it as Balzaman or any Forsaken or any character, that would actually be really cool. So if you want to do any of that, send it to my email at gleemanradio at gmail.com. Uh, it would be really, really fun. I, I doubt I'm going to get any feedback this early, but who knows? I'm putting the feelers out. I'm going to be uh, asking this on and off in these very first ones and see if anybody's interested. I think it would be really, really cool. Also, put down your, your thoughts of the chapter in the comment section below. I'd love if people were reading with me. That would be really cool. Let me know what you want me to talk about in the chapter. What did I not talk about in this prologue that you think I should have? What what did I miss that you think was amazing? Or what did I cover that you liked? Well, you know, let me know. This is going to be so much fun and I hope you enjoy this journey with me. So without further ado, I think I'm going to get out of here because shockingly, the prologue is almost a 30 minute video. Uh, the, the actual time of the prologue on the audiobook when I was listening on Audible was only like 18 minutes and 50 seconds. So this has gone on longer than the actual freaking prologue, which is hilarious to me. Anyways, take care everyone. Peace out. Bye.